Romany and Back by G. Bramwell Evans. Give me the clear blue sky over my head and the green turf beneath my feet, a winding road before me, and then to thinking. Chapter 16 on Buying Lambs, May. Green England was the phrase that fell from my lips as the dog and I walked over the fields. And yet how poor it is to describe the spring beauty. Looking at the growing grass and using it as a standard colour, how varying is the shade which we call green. There is the tender sap green of the chestnut, the darker grey green of the elm. The holly looks sombre against the yellow green of the new leaves of the oak. There are hundreds of varying greens. What a beautiful mosaic the fields of England must present to the lark, which soars high overhead. The flaming lemon of the charlock, the deep gold of the buttercups, the light magenta of clover, the purple brown of the clean earth, all framed in the white beading of May blossom. By the beck we sat down and listened to its gurgles and its tinkling laughter. No wonder David's harp charmed the evil spirit from Saul. Even so does the music of running water banish the blight of city life. At such times of indolence I like to listen to the natural voices around me. Not far away a curlew bubbled out its song, joyful that its youngsters were safe and sound in the field. In the grass, the grasshopper fizzed and scraped, and at times I heard the needle-like challenge of some tiny shrew. Then a big, blundering bumblebee came near, and played a heavy trombone solo as he fell on some open flower. Zit-zit, cried the kingfisher as it flitted by. Beer, beer, finished off the greenfinch. Just around the beauty of it all, a pied wagtail appeared on the shingle and tripped with mincing steps and flicking tail. What an orchestra played whilst it danced its tiny two-step. I looked down at Rack. He had his eyes half closed, but his nose kept twitching. His friend is the breeze which brings him tidings of what lurks in the bush and grass. The same scene which thrills and quietens me is before him. How differently we react to it. And yet our appreciation of natural beauty is, comparatively speaking, of recent growth. We climbed up the hill which leads from the beck to the farm. Soon the sounds which we heard were very different from those down in the glen. There was the cackle of hens and the satisfied grunts of sleeping pigs. In the distance a cow was calling for the calf which was not allowed to run with her. Swallows were chittering as they dashed into the open door of the barn, whilst the old goose and gander stretched out long necks and, looking at you with inflamed eyes, hissed like serpents. Up the track which leads to the farm I saw a stranger making his way. By his side trotted a black and white sheepdog, and in a moment or two the barking of the farm dogs, interspersed with a few snarls and growls, told me that he was at the kitchen door. A few minutes later, when I arrived, I found him drawn up to the table with Alan and Joe, having the proverbial at ten o'clock. Charlotte had told me, as I passed through the scullery, that Dick Whitley's here after buying some lambs, I reckon but no one would have dreamed that such was his business by listening to the conversation. Yet everyone around that table knew why he had come. They talked about the weather, and agreed that a good supper rain would do the crops good. Dick related what he had seen various farmers doing as he had crossed their lands. White Rig was cleaning out his ditches, and Red Dyke was fattening up his gates and hedges. No reference whatever was made to the fact that he himself had come up to the farm to buy lambs. This main business seemed to me to be put deliberately into the background, yet each party knew that in a few moments it would be the centre of interest. How differently I should have proceeded had I been the buyer. 
I should have walked up to the farm and, having found Joe, I should have begun at once by saying, Good morning, Joe. Have you any lambs for sale? And if so, what are you asking for them? But that is the direct method of the city, and it's not the way of the tillers of the soil. Theirs is more leisurely, but none the less sure. We of the town delight in making frontal attacks, but those of the land walk quietly round their Jericho, without sound or fuss, until the walls fall down flat. Such I saw was to be the strategy of the morning, for, after the ten o'clock was over, each drew out his pipe and filled it to the brim. Such a sign told me that the selling and buying of lambs was not going to be a quick incident. It was going to have all the elements of a campaign. Finally, when the pipes were well lit, without a word being said, we all filed out into the yard and drifted towards the pen in which a few lambs bleated out their dissatisfaction. When the pen was reached, it was interesting to watch the movements of the interested parties. Joe leaned up against the wall. Alan sat down on the edge of a water trough, and Dick looked quietly at the lambs, at the same time straddling out his legs and pushing back his cap from off his forehead. Neither Alan nor Joe took any notice of him. They were gazing abstractedly, the one at the distant hills, the other at the ground immediately in front of him. Dick's dog lay at his feet with his nose between his paws. He had evidently witnessed many such scenes and knew the ritual by heart. Finally, after Dick had gazed at them long and earnestly and had made up his mind that they really were lambs and not hyenas or giraffes, he climbed over into the pens for a closer inspection. It was at this moment that my two farm friends stirred with new life. The struggle was about to start. The seconds were out of the ring and both parties were about to spar for an opening. They leaned over the pen and puffed vigorously at their pipes, each suck being distinctively given. Each suck saying to Dick, who was feeling the youngsters, There's a lamb for you, finest in the district. Whilst across the countenance of the buyer there flitted a look of disappointment, even of gloom. Now, had I been buying a lamb, I should have used very different tactics from Dick. I should have lifted it by the shoulders to see whether its front legs were straight, and have run my hands down its neck and spine, and pressed firmly on its hind quarters, as the judges do at the dog shows. I should have looked at its teeth and the expression in its eyes. Probably, too, I should have felt its breastbone, even as one feels the breast of a chicken to see whether it be plump. Dick, however, placed one hand firmly on its back and pressed evenly, steadily, at the same time looking as serious as though he was settling some very knotty problem in theology. Meanwhile, his other hand sought for the tail and grasped it. It is here that the lamb carries the secret of its well-being. I do not imply that one must take notice of how it carries its tail. One must not expect it to hold it stiff and erect, defiant as a rough-haired terrier carries his, or insultingly bare as does the billy goat. But I learn that if the tail be fat and well nourished, then the rest of the lamb will tally with it. The tail is the index to the lamb. If the steering gear be right, you needn't worry about the bow. Even so, Dick's hand felt the tail of each beast. Then a sigh escaped him, and he gave a slight shake of his head. This last movement was intended to convey to Alan and Joe, who were watching him keenly, that he was not over-pleased with the lambs. It was a gesture intended to keep down prices. The brothers hardly said a word, but they made great inroads into their stock of tobacco. Finally, after all had been examined, some having been faintly praised, others deprecated, Dick climbed out of the pen. The battle of prices was about to begin in real earnest. My impressions are that in buying and selling lambs there are ten rounds. In this contest, each round commence with Dick asking Joe what he thinks they are worth. One must never, on any account, ask the price direct. This is fatal to the lamb's life. Each round closed with Dick saying what he thinks they are worth, 
and Joe saying in a hurt tone, as though he were wounded to the depths of his being, I can't let him go for that, Dick. As the opposing forces grew a little tired of mere footwork, then each side tried a little infighting, and, as a result, prices on each side tended to be modified. Each party, so to speak, retired to his corner, the one offering a little more, and the other pondering as to whether he could let them go. The final bout was usually a compromise, and it was only when Dick and Joe appeared to have reached the limit of concessions that I ventured to butt in. How do you stand now? I asked. There is nine bob between us, answered Joe. That's a matter of eighteen pence a lamb, I said, looking at the six bleaters in the pen. Neither bargainer appeared as though he would budge an inch, nor you would a halfpenny. Joe leaned up against the pen, smoking his pipe, giving all his answers in the same way. He never looked directly at Dick, but shook his head and gazed intently at the horizon of the hills. Alan also did not speak, but when Joe negatived an offer, he just raised his cap and scratched the top of his head. This gave an impersonal touch to the haggling. Joe was selling neither for friendship nor with meanness. It was a strict business, and personal relations did not come into it. Then Dick picked up his stick and walked towards the gate that led from the farm. Nothing doing, I whispered to Alan, but he gave me a wink, and I noticed, too, that Joe had not moved from the pen. Dick reached the gate, but did not walk through it. He turned and made another offer to Joe, and, as the latter considered it, walked back towards him. As a matter of fact, though the gate was only a few yards distant, Dick did not reach it for nearly an hour. Each time that he neared it, he turned round and either he or Joe said, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll take... So, like a shuttle, Dick moved between the pen and the gate. Why don't you split the nine bob, I asked at last in sheer desperation. As I said this, Dick had his hand on the gate, but at the brilliance of my suggestion and the depth of original thinking which it displayed, he once more turned back and said hopefully, What do you say to that, Joe? Then Joe came suddenly to life. He knocked the ashes out of his pipe. Alan, I noticed, did the same. Deliberately spat on the ground, raised his cap, mugged at the back of his head, grasped the buyer's hand and gave it a resounding smack, palm meeting palm, and thus clenched the bargain. They're yours, he said decisively, 